Palliative and End-of-Life Care by Dr. Joanne Wolf. I'm Dr. Joanne Wolf. I am the Division Chief of Pediatric Palliative Care in the Department of Psychosocial Oncology and Palliative Care at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. I'm also the Director of Pediatric Palliative Care at Boston Children's Hospital and together with many others run the Pediatric Advanced Care Team, a palliative care service at Children's and Dana-Farber. During this talk, uh, we're going to answer the following questions. What is palliative care? Who are the children receiving palliative care? What is suffering and how do we begin to address it? What are basic palliative care communication strategies? And has palliative care improved outcomes? Overview of palliative care. This model, I think, encapsulates uh, our approach to pediatric palliative care. Essentially, palliative care is offered to children with serious illness along the illness continuum. It's an individualized blending of care directed at the underlying illness and the physical, emotional, social, and spiritual needs of the child and family with continuous reevaluation and adjustment. In this model, you see end of life care as a distinct period of time. While not always extremely well delineated, it's the time in a child's life, should they reach the end of life, where care is almost primarily focused on comfort. Now, that period of time can be moments, for example, in the intensive care unit when a child is receiving ventilatory support and there's a decision together with the family to discontinue the ventilator and allow the child to reach the natural end of their life. And that may last moments, minutes, hours, to uh, a period of time that might extend over days to weeks, for example, in a child with advanced cancer where a decision has been made for that child to receive care primarily at home and focused almost entirely on comfort. The bereavement period begins well before the end of life care period and lasts well beyond the death of the child for as we know bereavement uh, among families of children who have died is a very prolonged and very complex and almost never goes away, but rather gets integrated into the day-to-day -day, uh, living of those parents and perhaps bereaved children. If we embrace this model of care, we embrace what families often tell us are their hopes for their child and their families. That is, they hope for cure, life extension, or even a miracle, not as an either-or approach, and at the same time hope for comfort and meaning. The core ideals of palliative care involve uh, a number of uh, components. Uh, open and ongoing communication, intensive symptom management, timely access to care across the continuum of care from inpatient, outpatient to the home setting, a flexible approach to care, psychosocial and spiritual support, the care that's delivered any place and any time with the goal of ensuring me meaningful experiences for the child and family. One a key element to delivering palliative care is working within an interdisciplinary care team. As you can see, the center of attention, the, the focal point of care is the patient and the family, and the team works together to help the child live as well as possible and often as long as possible um, in an integrated manner. So often we see physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, chaplains, social workers, pharmacists, child life specialists, just to name a few, working in an integrated manner to create these opportunities for children and their families. Importantly, pediatric palliative care is delivered at both a primary and subspecialty level. So for example, if a child's being cared for by a pediatrician and um, an interdisciplinary team involving a social worker and a care coordinator, for example, that team will provide primary interdisciplinary support. Another example may be for ex in, in the oncology setting where the child has a primary oncologist, 
a psychosocial clinician, a nurse involved in the care, as well as the pediatrician and the pediatric team in the community. Subspecialty palliative care may become involved through a consultative process in settings where the clinical care of the child or the psychosocial care or the spiritual care of the child and family is more complex. Importantly, to introduce subspecialty palliative care, it's often uh, helpful to describe the pediatric palliative care team as an added layer of interdisciplinary support for the child and family. Subspecialty palliative care teams often provide education in order to enhance the knowledge, skills, behaviors, and attitudes of clinical teams throughout hospital settings and in the communities. Subspecialty pediatric palliative care teams also pursue innovation and research in order to advance the field in general and through advocacy to create system-wide changes. Point of clarification. Primary palliative care refers to basic skills and competencies related to communication, pain and symptom management, decision making, psychosocial support, and coordination of care that can be provided by a primary pediatrician or primary subspecialty pediatrician, depending on the patient's underlying disease process. This is helpful for the patient and family because these providers and related care teams often have meaningful longitudinal relationships with the patient and family. Subspecialty palliative care provides an added layer of support and should be considered, for example, in consultation for complex situations related to communication, refractory pain, and symptom management, difficult decision-making, or challenges related to coordination of care and psychosocial support. Another important distinction is the difference between palliative care and hospice care. As I just described, palliative care is a model of care that can be delivered throughout the continuum of care in a home setting, inpatient setting, clinic setting, and residential setting. As noted, there's primary and subspecialty palliative care that focuses on enhanced communication, symptom management, psychosocial and spiritual care, and care coordination. Patient eligibility. In terms of eligibility for palliative care, any child with a serious and or life-threatening diagnosis would be eligible for palliative care at any stage of the illness. An important innovation in Massachusetts is the Massachusetts Pediatric Palliative Care Program, a statewide program that was developed in 2006 that provides home-based pediatric palliative care throughout the state. These programs are actually based in hospices, but the clinicians that deliver the pediatric palliative care throughout the state have expertise um, specifically focused on the palliative care needs of children and their families and is not through the hospice benefit. The hospice benefit is a Medicare benefit that's often extended to Medicaid and private insurers. It involves home, inpatient, and or residential delivery of end-of-life care. Similar to palliative care, the domains of care include enhanced communication, intensive symptom management, psychosocial and spiritual support, and coordination of care. But eligibility is very different. In order to be eligible for hospice, the child must be considered as having a six, prognosis of six months or less and um, that is something that needs to be delineated by the primary clinician. Uh, hospice care uh, involves enrollment periods and a family may choose to have their child enrolled and the child can also be unenrolled without consequences. Very importantly with the um, development of the Affordable Care Act this now allows for concurrent hospice care for children with uh, advanced illness. So for example, a child who's receiving extended hour nursing in the home, perhaps a child with an advanced neurological condition, 
may now also receive hospice if the child meets those eligibility criteria without foregoing their block nursing. This is a really wonderful innovation for children um, through the Affordable Care Act, a blending of both care directed at the underlying illness and uh, care directed at the child's comfort. So who are the children receiving palliative care? In a multi-centered study involving six uh, pediatric palliative care programs in the United States and Canada, Chris Futner and colleagues described a cohort of 515 patients receiving pediatric palliative care. These children were followed for a year, and as you can see from this slide, uh, importantly, children receiving palliative care often survive beyond one year. This is evidence for the early involvement of pediatric palliative care services in the care of children with serious illness. In fact, in this cohort of 515 patients, only about 25% of children died over the course of the year. The children in this study who received palliative care uh, had various diagnoses. The most common diagnoses were congenital and genetic disorders and neuromuscular disorders. Cancer, uh, though common as a leading cause of death in childhood, only accounted for 20% of the children receiving pediatric palliative care. Other underlying conditions included children with respiratory disorders, gastrointestinal disorders, and cardiovascular disorders, to name a few. Children receiving palliative care often uh, are also receiving um, high technological support. Uh, this slide shows that uh, a majority of children receiving palliative care, for example, had feeding tubes in place. Uh, over 20% had central venous catheters, and about 10% of children receiving pediatric palliative care had either tracheostomy, non-invasive ventilation, and or were ventilatory dependent. Now, this is a very complex slide, but it's, the image is one that conveys that children receiving palliative care are often receiving multiple medications. Uh, what you can see here are the common medications received by children receiving palliative care. The larger circles represent the more common medications. The darker circles represent the medications that children are receiving closer to end of life. So for example, amongst those who died, morphine was a very common uh, medication that was prescribed. The lines between these medications represent medications that are prescribed at the same time. I think the main point of this slide is to underscore that children with advanced illness often are receiving multiple medications and that is representative of the complex care that they are also often receiving. Understanding suffering. So what is suffering and how do we begin to address it? Eric Cassell wrote a very interesting book called The Nature of Suffering, and in this book he describes suffering as a specific state of distress that occurs when the intactness or the integrity of the person is threatened or disrupted. It lasts until the threat is gone or the integrity is restored. Importantly, the meanings and, and the fear are personal and individual so that even if two patients have the same symptoms, their suffering would be different. So prior to the diagnosis of a serious or life-threatening illness, a family comes to the experience with their own self-integrity. And then there's the diagnosis of a serious illness, and there are visible threats, such as the illness itself and the symptoms and the emotional factors that come along with the introduction of that illness. There are also invisible threats, disruptions from normal living, invisible emotional factors, existential concerns, and certainly socio-demographic factors, for example. And together, these threats result in child and family suffering. In order to ease that suffering, there need to be targeted interventions, such as treatment of the underlying illness or symptom treatment trials, 
and then global interventions such as communication and interdisciplinary teamwork, for example. And together, these interventions ease suffering with the goal of restoring family integrity. This may be different from the prior family integrity, but uh, the whole idea is to enable families to bear what is often unbearable and to move, move forward in the face of the child's serious illness. What are basic palliative care communication strategies? The conversation that frames the approach to caring for a child with a serious illness and their family is a goals of care discussion. And there are what I believe are five cardinal questions that help to uh, develop a care plan or goals of care for a child and family. The first question that we often start with as a palliative care service is simply to ask the family to tell us about their child as a person. What is he or she like? What do they enjoy? Often when we start our conversations with families, they'll then start to talk about the medical condition that their child may have. But we ask them to take a step back to describe their child perhaps even before they became ill or in the context of their child's long-term illness uh, what they're like as a person. What do they enjoy? How do they interact with other family members? What makes them happy? Once we have a sense of that, and it often um, by starting with the question, what is your child like as a person, it establishes that we're having a different kind of com conversation with the family, and also that we are concerned with um, aspects of the child and family that are difficult from the typical medical conversation. Following that question, we then ask, tell us about your understanding of your child's illness. That helps us to understand uh, the family perspective of the illness and what their understanding is both of the technical aspects of the illness but also the prognosis for that child's illness or condition. Following that question, we ask to understand what's on the family's mind what's most important to you? Um, what are your hopes and what are your worries? These questions often elucidate answers for we're hoping for cure, we're hoping for life extension, um, we're, we're hoping that our child does not experience suffering. Families often present dual goals or more than one, one hope for their child and at the same time they express worries. What if those hopes are not realized. Finally, a really important question that helps us to know how best to support a family is to ask them where they find their strength in the face of difficulties. Often this question um, uncovers families' um, sources of support such as they will often answer their child, um, their spouse, other loved ones in the family, and at the same time they may uh, speak to a spirituality or a faith base that also lends them support. We often follow up that question with, and how, it, how are those sources of support uh, working for you now? Again, to uncover ways in which we might be able to uh, strengthen the support that surrounds the family. However, we often have to also be very thoughtful about the language that we use in communicating with patients and their families. Uh, thinking back to Eric Cassell again, he has said that similar to scalpels for surgeons, words are the palliative care clinician's greatest tools. Surgeons learn to use their tools with extreme precision because any error can be devastating. So too should clinicians who rely on words. For example, there's often words that are very common in um, our medical lexicon that may send unintended messages to families. For example, it is not uncommon for a clinician to say, well, we can offer this treatment or we can do nothing. And the statement of doing nothing implies that perhaps we will abandon that child and family or that child will be left to sort of suffer um, at the end of life. 
rather than say do nothing, we would always want to promote the idea that we would do everything to continue to support a child and family, no matter what decisions are around specific treatments. Another uh, common uh, statement or question that is asked of families is simply, what would you like us to do? That kind of question is often uh, asked in the context of decisions around resuscitation status. What would you like us to do? Uh, often that leaves the burden of decision making solely on the shoulders of families. In our experience, uh, if we've had a proper goals of care conversation with families, rather than simply asking them what would, you, what would you like us to do, we say, in light of my understanding or in light of our understanding of your goals for your child, I would recommend, and then we make a recommendation around resuscitation status so that we are sharing the decision making and not burdening families uh, with that sole responsibility. Goals of care often fall into one of three categories. For some families, they hope that their child lives as long as possible and hold out a strong hope for cure, even at the expense of uh, possible suffering and discomfort, understanding that the end result is what's most important. In other situations, families hope that their child live as long as possible and as well as possible, perhaps understanding that there isn't uh, an opportunity for, uh, be, for the child to be cured and getting beyond the illness that they're experiencing. And finally, there might be a, a goal of living as comfortably as possible, especially towards the end of life. Now these three different general goals will frame our approach to how we take care of the child. From a differential diagnosis, if a child ex is experiencing a distressing symptom, for example, we will always consider a differential diagnosis. However, the assessment of that symptom may vary according to goal of care. So for example, if a family is hoping that the child live as long as possible, we may take a very intensive approach to assessment as well as an intensive approach to treatment and follow-up. If there's a blended approach to goals of care, living as long as possible and as well as possible, then assessment may be more targeted, treatment may be more targeted, but follow-up will always be intensive. And then similarly, for a child whose family is hoping that they live as comfortably as possible, there may be a limited assessment, a flexible and at times empiric approach to treatment, but again, always intensive follow-up. Palliative care outcomes. The qu uh, question often arises, has palliative care improved outcomes? There are as yet limited data amongst uh, children receiving palliative care. However, emerging data in the adult literature to show um, a lot of added value to palliative care intervention. For example, the Temel and colleagues study published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2010 showed importantly uh, that if early, in, and this was a randomized control trial, uh, with early uh, palliative care in comparison to standard care, there was a significant improvement in quality of life of patients um, receiving pa early palliative care. There was a significant decrease in depression amongst those patients. And very importantly, there was an increase in survival amongst patients receiving earlier, earlier palliative care. As you can see here, amongst those receiving early palliative care, survival was 11.6 months compared to standard care which was 8.9 months. And you could imagine or hypothesize some reasons for uh, increased survival, which is if you focus on the well-being of an individual, you may actually contribute to their resilience in the face of a life-threatening illness and therefore improve their survival. 
Utilization, healthcare utilization, was also affected by early palliative care with a mean decrease in two days of inpatient stay amongst patients receiving early, early palliative care, as well as earlier introduction of hospice to those receiving earlier palliative care. In pediatrics, we, as I noted, do not have as much uh, empiric data as yet. However, in one study that was conducted here at Children's Hospital in Dana-Farber, looked at the uh, changes in care amongst uh, children with cancer at end of life in an era when palliative care had been introduced into the care of these children compared to a baseline study before palliative care was available. And what we showed in this study was, uh, according to their bereaved parents, among children who were receiving care at the end of life in the era of having palliative care available to them, there was a significant decrease in suffering caused by very common symptoms such as pain, shortness of, of breath, and to a certain extent, anxiety. Also, we noted a change in patterns of care. So for example, in the era after palliative care services were introduced, significantly fewer children were dying in the intensive care unit. These data suggest that there might be um, added value to having palliative care services involved in the care of children as well, but needless to say, uh, more data are needed. So to conclude, in thinking about pediatric palliative care, I think that it's uh, encapsulated very well by the quote from this mother, and it goes as follows. Another mother, the mother of Eric, comes up to them. It's all very hard, she says, her head cocked to one side, but there's a lot of collateral beauty along the way. That is exactly what pediatric palliative care is intended in the setting of very complex, serious illness in children. Uh, our hope is to integrate care that's focused on the well-being of the child and family and as such create collateral beauty in the way of meaningful experiences for both these families and their children and ourselves as caregivers as well. Thank you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.